Hello and welcome. I am Gohar Raza and you are watching Eureka. Professor Sudhir Kumar Sopori, an eminent plant molecular biologist, one of India's most distinguished scientific minds. After graduation and post-graduation from Jammu and Kashmir University, Professor Sopori pursued a doctorate in plant biology at Delhi University. He started his career in 1973 at the School of Life Sciences at Jawaharlal Nehru University. The next 40 odd years of teaching and research have been about path-breaking breakthroughs and landmarks in science and scientific learning. For his vast contribution, Professor Sapori has been honoured with various national and international awards. Among the most recognised are the Padma Shri and Bhatnagar Award. Professor Sapori recently retired as Vice Chancellor from Jawaharlal Nehru University. He defends the prestigious institution, saying its contribution to academics is often ignored amid a perception that JNU is a theatre of political activism. Welcome to Eureka. Professor Sopuri. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you at Eureka and RSTV. I know that you are extremely busy at the moment because you are in the process of winding up from Vice Chancellorship of Nehru University. And therefore, I'm extremely thankful that you gave us time. Let's go back to your childhood. Were you a curious student and that's why you decided to join science? Or was it influence of parents or teachers that motivated you to do science? Uh, it, it, uh, right uh, till the end of schooling, there was uh, nothing very specific preference for science or any other subjects. And uh, I had also thought of uh, getting into law at one time. And uh, or I had some uh, liking good for... Good that you didn't uh, join I didn't know. <laughs> we would and have also lost a good scientist. And also I thought uh, I had uh, some interest in arts and uh, like dancing and other things, but there were no opportunities of that kind in Srinagar to get into those areas. But once I went into college, uh, they started at that time an honors course in botany. And that was the first time they started. And they said those students would be, uh, you know, screened out and uh, who found good, they can simultaneously do an honors course. And it was during that honors course I got more exposed to the life of the plants and that uh, stuck with me at that moment. And when I went to master's program, I took uh, botany as my uh, master's program. Do you remember some teachers who motivated you at that time? I think in my master's program, one of the teacher, Professor Call, uh, he was a great teacher. Uh, he was teaching us uh, lower plants and fungal systems, uh, how these uh, grow, their life cycles, uh, and also the genetics background based on which uh, these plants or these uh, lower animal plants, uh, you know, respond to different uh, environmental conditions. He was a great teacher. I, uh, even today, when I meet him, I talk to him, he's still in Jammu, and uh, meet him. I think there is always something to learn from him. So he was I'm one sure great... I'm sure is listening to yeah. this program yeah. and would be very excited to know that he transformed you and he motivated he you. Was, to... uh, in fact, I took up a small project with him and master's degree. He said those of the students who are more interested in research, I can take them. So he was a geneticist basically. So three, four of us we took up an additional, this was not part of the coursework, we said we we'll want to do some coursework with you, some experiments with you, and he gave us a project, and that actually motivated me into research work. In fact, one of that uh, work which we did that time really got published, he could get it published from my oh, master's, very early uh, earliest age. master's work, you know, and uh, we were able to look into the cytology of certain important plants. And, Why did you uh, have to come to Delhi University to do further studies and your PhD? You know, after my master's uh, program, uh, my family, uh, although we're, we're not too well off, I uh, had five uh, brothers, uh, six brothers, we are there, one sister. My father died at a very early age, when I was four years old. Mm -hmm. And my uncle was helping us. So my mother always wanted that I should go and take up a job, you know, because uh, don't delay too much. And I, you were the eldest? Uh, no. Uh, no. So, and then I started uh, looking for some jobs. 
I tried for bank, you know, examinations or LIC examinations. My elder brother used to say, do this. He was in a bank, but I failed everywhere. <laughs> I also tried a, Good that you failed there. <laughs> and also a job I tried in Delhi when I came with a, a school teacher in Mother's International. I remember I went there to appear in the interview and they said you are overqualified or whatever it is. I didn't get that. So I was more or less dejected. And in Srinagar, the person with whom I wanted to do PhD, if at all, I would have a uh, person call. Uh, uh, I think he shifted to Jammu. And uh, I was not interested in many other subjects at that time. So, so I came to... By this time you were focused. I was a little more focused on that I should get into either physiology, genetics uh, uh, areas. And then I came to Delhi. Uh, while looking at these jobs, one day I found an advertisement uh, from Delhi University, uh, Professor Satish Maheshwari, who is son of the famous Panchanan Maheshwari, the great botanist. He himself had done a lot of great work. So... I went to him and said that I'm interested in uh, doing my PhD in uh, Delhi University with him. He interviewed and said that uh, you have to work with me for two, three months without fellowship. If I find you suitable, then I will keep you and then your fellowship will start. So let me see how motivated you are. <laughs> so I continued, uh, I was staying with my brother here and traveling in DTC buses must be from, very hard for you from to Lodi, do. From Lodi Road to Delhi University. For three months I worked uh, with him without anything. And uh, then he finally, I don't know what he found. He said, no, I think you can be in science. <laughs> so he said, you so have a job. potential to be a scientist. He, probably found, he was another great uh, person, you know, uh, who motivated me. In uh, doing science in a way where you can ask right questions. Uh, define what you want to do and that, that was and how to speak how to write I think he, he is a great teacher a great teacher I still admire him uh, for whatever he has uh, shown the path to me we'll continue the discussion I have to take a break don't go anywhere we'll come back soon welcome back uh, professor Sopuri you started asking the right kind of questions or you are started asking questions and got interested into it? I think every question is important question, you know. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, we were working in that uh, daily school of uh, botany, had uh, started experimental embryology as a major uh, work. And, uh, and during my PhD, although I wanted to do something else, there were many other hindrances which came my way. Finally, I did some work on tissue culture of, you know, anthers. There were plants have these anther and within that there is pollen right. grains. And they were taking the pollen grains out and putting into the test tubes and getting plant out of this. And this was the technology which was developed by them. And uh, this has a lot of uh, implications in uh, plant breeding. And uh, many countries abroad are now use this called the haploid technology. Right. And this was the discovery of the Delhi University. So I was, we were asking questions, what are the factors by which uh, pollen grain, which is uh, a male gametophyte, can develop into plant without fertilization. There is no fertilization. So there are haploids. Right. Uh, it's like getting a uh, human out of sperm alone. You know, right. That was the great uh, discovery which was made. So we started looking into that. And uh, there we found that uh, besides many chemical factors, light is a very important factor that uh, induces development uh, responses. Now, as you mentioned earlier, the light has many effects. One is a major is photosynthesis. But we started asking questions whether other than photosynthesis, photosynthesis, of course, will produce all the energy, uh, give the energy for plant to develop. Right. But are there other pathways by which light uh, regulates the plant developmental processes? And that was something which I thought I should look into. And there are many other people around Were the world. Were you excited when you asked this question yes, for I, the first I was, time? Yes, I was. I was. Because uh, uh, if you grow the plants in darkness or in light, you see the difference in their developmental state. So light does something to it in other than photosynthesis. And uh, in fact, uh, there was some work even done in Professor Maheshwari's lab that plant can time light and dark cycle. And this was known for flowering response. Like many right. plants require light for flowering. 
Uh, in fact, people later found that it is not the light, it is the darkness which is so important. Was it, was it uh, this question that you asked, was it only uh, an, a scientifically important question or you saw also implications for the society? It could be, it has implications because if you can regulate... No, uh, today the, after you after have you, done the work, yeah. you know the implications. Course, uh, at it, that time, did you think time, that no, it will have that, social that, implications? No, that time I absolutely... And economic no. implications? No, no, not at all because many other people were working... So it was the scientific it was question that excited you? That's the only scientific question with us. Yes. And when I came back to JNU, when I started my career in JNU, this question kept on, uh, on haunting was, you. Uh, so we wanted to know whether plants, like just like human beings, uh, have certain receptors, like in our eye we have rods and cones and retinas, do plants have something like similar uh, things? And by the time many people in 50s and 60s had given some idea that there are photoreceptors in the plant systems which uh, perceive red light, uh, blue light and other lights. There are different kinds of photoreceptors which are currently known. So we started looking into those uh, things, how plants uh, receive the light through photoreceptors and how photoreceptors then give signals within the cells by which uh, the gene expression changes and you get new proteins and how these new proteins then regulate the developmental processes in the plant system. So that has been one uh, study which I have carried out uh, for many years in a very simple way, but we are getting many uh, good answers to this, especially one of the interesting experiments which one of for this you got uh, Bhatnagar Award. Award. It was the, uh, thing. This whole journey of, of answering a question and then getting into many more areas as you have done in your research, was there a moment of Eureka? Yeah, of course. When you got course. very excited and said that I've cracked this, this it. This is where, where, you know, one of the things which was about this memory thing, that how that plants can remember. You know, in what form they remember is something which we still want to understand. Uh, I've tried some experiments. The moment you realize that yeah. plants have memory. Memory mechanisms. Uh, you know, that that was, was the moment of Eureka for you. That was one of the things. And yeah. where is this memory? How this, do they restore? This actually is, uh, we really do not understand exactly, but there are certain chemical compounds, some signals which are produced. And it's the life cycle of that uh, molecules or the signals uh, through which this memory mechanisms uh, probably operates. You shifted to a uh, transgenic area, which is a very uh, area hot at the moment. There are many questions which touch economics and politics, not only science. Mm -hmm. It's a very emotional area, especially in, in uh, developing countries. How do you look at uh, the future of transgenic uh, research? Now, after I shifted from JNU to uh, ICGB, where I worked for almost 14, 15 years, my broader question remained the same, which was how li plants perceive external environment. Light was one. But we also started looking at the stress environment. Uh, and sometimes plants have less biotic of water. And other stresses. Biotic. I was mainly on the abiotic stresses. Abiotic. I didn't do too much work on biotic stresses. Uh, this is salinity, drought, uh, heat, and cold. But uh, more specifically on drought and salinity. And while we were working on this, uh, we identified a totally new pathway, uh, which may be involved in uh, stress physiology of the plants. And this is what we call as the glyoxylase pathway. I'm very proud of this because uh, uh, our group was the one which has done maximum work on this uh, biochemical pathway in the plant systems. And it is well recognized uh, all over. But transgenics was taken also as a system through which you can study the function of the genes. We have done function of many other genes. But you uh, can also manipulate and you can manipulate, manipulate to an extent where it may not be good for the humanity as... Mm -hmm. as, as a lot of groups argue. No, I think uh, in this particular cases, what we had, uh, we had the genes from the plants, the regulatory elements from the plants. So we're not taking anything from outside the uh, plant, uh, plant kingdom. kingdom. And uh, therefore, I thought uh, there is not too much of a problem in terms of taking bacterial genes or other genes. And we also developed technology where we are not using any reporter genes like antibiotic genes and other things. We developed our own technology of selecting these plants without any of these uh, antibiotic markers. 
So, we have plants which are antibiotic free, they have the uh, regulatory gene elements, everything from within the plant systems. But currently we are not able to test this one, but this will have lot of, this technology has lot of potential in agriculture system. It is not to be replaced by any other technology, but this is a in addition to the normal breeding, because even in this you need breedings. Yes. It is not that you just produce. But there is a lot of fear. Uh, fear that, that's is uh, generated around uh, the issues hmm. that are related to transgenic. I, anyway, I have to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be come back. We'll come back after a short. Welcome back, Professor Sobhuri, a first-rate scientist who has taken sabbatical for good suddenly finds himself uh, in a university as a vice chancellor. Now you have to do a lot of administrative work, run the university, run the installation, including science. And in the university where you have spent a lot of time, you have seen it growing or, or you grew with the university or university grew with you. You have seen good times, bad times, emergency, all those things happening here. Very vibrant, bubbling university. What has been your experience as vice chancellor? This was a very, very different kind of experience for me, you know. I was too much tuned to my lab, you know. I sometimes used to call myself as a lab rat, you know, because you don't know anything <laughs> more than what is happening beyond your test tubes and your own questions which you are talking about. Uh, answers to those questions through experiment excite you and you continue to go deeper and deeper to understand how uh, cells and the plants and other things uh, grow, develop and how to use these for uh, society. But being a vice chancellor when you interacted, uh, interacted with every faculty member in this university, that I made it a point that I visit every school and center. Uh, I talked to all the students uh, and uh, got feedback from them. Uh, I thought uh, I, doors were all always open for discussion. Doors, my any student could come. You know, we had open doors. Students can come. But I used to usually discuss academics with them. Of course, for issues like hostels and others, there was separate timing for those. Uh, so I found that uh, our knowledge, uh, in terms of scientists, of course, are involved. But I think they uh, are not ex exposing themselves to the reality of the societies all around it. For example, there are many groups here who are working on uh, parasite biology, uh, infectious diseases and other things. I have a center which is on public health center, community health center. There is no communication. Now it's, it, we're telling them, why don't you talk to each other? Infection biology and community health has a lot of things to common, but uh, each one is within their own domains. So one of the main things which I thought I was able to partially achieve was to break this barrier and develop transdisciplinary virtual clusters. So talk to each other, have seminars, uh, students brought them uh, interaction. And in the process, because I used to attend many seminars, talk to students, uh, meet them, I think I'm a different person. I'm enriched myself very differently. I can look at uh, issues uh, at a much uh, wider perspective. It's something like when you're traveling in a helicopter and looking at the flood which is there, you get a broader view of everything. But if you are within your own house, you think you are only affected. And uh, I think that is the kind of a perception which one gets. In India, the scientific community does not act as watchdog of science policy. Uh, even if they are INSA and many other academies. Like in Canada, uh, the government passed a resolution that all science is strategic science, so therefore you cannot publish it without permission from various authorities mm -hmm. and scientists revolted. This doesn't happen in India. Why is it that scientific community doesn't uh, play a much bigger role in, in deciding the science policy of the country? I think we would see that uh, the recent biotechnology policy which was given by government of India or earlier policies which have come. Individually scientists are involved. Because even like a science and technology ministry, department of biotechnology, they do involve scientists uh, in those committees. 
and uh, their input is taken in. But as a society, as a broader society like Indian uh, National Science Academies and others, they also have discussions, but somehow the thought processes of these societies, other things do not absolutely get reflected uh, in the broader science policy. But individually, yes, uh, it is only the scientists uh, who uh, sitting in the committees give those ideas that what we should do. And also prime ministers, uh, national uh, this uh, uh, science uh, people are there who advise them. So it's we we advise and we are also sometimes we who criticize also. <laughs> so I think there has to be a mechanism by which uh, more and more views and inputs even from the younger people are taken on board. Uh, yes. Does it worry you that the investment in science and technology research, especially the fundamental research and basic research that you have been involved in, uh, uh, is, is, uh, needs to be increased and there is not sufficient fund at the moment in the country? Does it worry you that it will jeopardize future of the country? I think if you see the last uh, decade or more, I think there has been an increase in the funding, uh, science and technology. But most of this funding, if you see, uh, goes only to those institutions and the universities where already there is a good base. Okay, now the question in this country would be how to expand this base. Now there may not be somebody who may be as competent as in Institute of Science or JNU or in any other science, CSR institutes, but he has the potential. But when he has to compete for the funding, he doesn't get it, that somebody else gets it. So if you have more funding and uh, targeted funding, I think you can give at least uh, sustain some of the groups in different uh, places and allow them to grow. The science has to spread besides uh, few universities and institutes uh, where most of the good research is going on. And unless that happens, like in China, they started many of these uh, key laboratories all around. And then the impact of this will be felt at a much uh, higher level. So I think funding surely needs to be increased, but also I feel identify people in many other places who can be funded and you expect something out of them. And who will deliver, who will deliver, right? good, will deliver. good science. Uh, but because of this competition, they are not able to get uh, as much money as well. Because their money is less. JNU is known as one of the universities uh, for the best research in social sciences. It's not really known for sciences in the country. How do you rate it as, as, as vice chancellor? Uh, well, actually, that's a, that's a kind of a myth. <laughs> because created by media? Social sciences, international studies, languages are some of the best uh, here because they are the uh, two-third of the university. But some of our science schools, uh, life sciences and others, if you look at the publication record of these ones, is very, very good. Uh, in fact, uh, they are under the DST PERS program last time, which they got. But uh, after the second review, their H index they found was much higher. And they said, we give you much more funding. I think the impact of some of the research and citations of science uh, faculty is very, very good. And kind of journals they are publishing uh, is uh, very impressive. And our special center for molecular medicines is one of the best recognized by even ICMR. JNU has a uh, political, uh, a different kind of people have different opinions, political opinions and social opinions. But I think uh, media is not looking at the academic activism, which I called in JNU, which is much, much stronger than what you is reflected in the media. I was mentioning that we have almost like 200 different uh, 50 seminars per year in different places, parts of the university, different schools and centers, and the kind of topics they talk about, the kind of discussions which are held there. Almost every day there would be one or two seminars, one or two symposium going on, and students' discussions going on, which doesn't get reflected uh, in the media. And our output, if you see that roughly around 130, 140 books per year published by this uh, university, or thousand publications which are coming in good impact journals. So I think there is a lot of academic output uh, from this university. And uh, that's what uh, gave us the 
uh, country's best uh, rating from NAC. It is the India's rating, you know, NAC is an India rating. Right. And uh, JNU was rated the best uh, university uh, from their point. It was not based on political activism, so but it was on academic things, you know. Now you are going to leave the university to younger generations. Um, do you leave as a very satisfied vice chancellor who has contributed and during his tenure, university he's, has achieved heights? or you are still worried about certain things? No. I think JNU can steer itself. Uh, why I'm confident is that I was able to recruit, uh, which had not been done for quite some time, more than 200 good faculty. There are young faculty uh, who have been recruited from across the globe, uh, from within the country, and they are, I think, very bright. In addition to the, already the faculty, which is the faculty and the students, will continue to drive the academic agenda of this university. And I'm sure they will take it to further heights. Excellence has no barriers. We can't uh, put a uh, threshold for any excellence. So I keep telling them, you have to raise your own bar and uh, move forward. And I'm very confident this university will uh, continue to be number one. <laughs> I hope so <laughs> in future also. And compete also with the international level. Uh, that's my hope. Best wishes to your dreams, yeah. which I'm sure uh, would be taken care of by the younger generations yeah. in Nehru University. May I on your behalf promise our viewers that you will be happy to answer any questions if they have? Sure, sure. Write to us. Our email address is eurekarstv at gmail.com. We'll be back next week once again with an outstanding scientist. Thank you very much for giving us so much of time. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you so much. much. Thanks.